All right, so welcome everybody. The speaker of today is Felix Luca from Amsterdam. Felix did his PhD in Munster and afterwards he moved to UCL for a postdoc and he's now in Amsterdam as a tenure track researcher. And today he's gonna talk about deep learning in computational imaging. Please, Felix, the floor is yours. Yeah, so uh, also welcome from my side and thanks a lot for the invitation. Um, I'm happy that we can do this, unfortunately, still virtually, but maybe then at some point I'll, I can come around and, and meet you guys in person again. Um, yeah, so today I want to give a bit of an overview of um, some projects that we do related to deep learning and computational imaging. And I have to say I'm not a sort of machine learning expert, um, so my background is rather in imaging and inverse problems. Um, and uh, also most of, or not all of the projects that I will uh, present today are work that I'm involved in myself, but uh, sometimes it's people, other people from our work group. Um, but I thought it would be more interesting to give a bit of an overview since I have so much time um, over different things that are going on. And I hope that you find certain things interesting and um, I'll also stick around for discussion. So uh, let me know if you have any sort of other questions or um, any comments. Okay, and um, yeah, I'll just start. Oh, wait. Ah, okay, I'll just start with the uh, usual pitch that I give if someone um, uh, outside of uh, academia asks me, okay, what what are you actually doing for a living, you know, as a, as a scientist? Um, so then I normally say something like, okay, uh, imagine you come to a hospital and the doctor doesn't know what's up with you and she doesn't want to cut you open right away and look into you. So instead, she'll put you in one of these tubes. Um, so for example, an X-ray CT scanner, is something that you see here on the left. And then these devices uh, give very nice images of the interior of your body. So for example, of your lungs, and then the doctor can look at it and, and, and make a diagnosis. But um, the data that these devices collect are not yet these nice images, you need to compute them from the data that the devices collect. And uh, that involves a lot of mathematics. And this is precisely uh, what I'm doing. And <clears throat> of course, I'm not doing this alone. So I'm part of the uh, computational imaging group yet CWI. CWI itself is uh, the Dutch National uh, Research Institute for uh, Mathematics and Computer Science. And uh, in that, we are a group for computational imaging. Uh, Tristan van Leeuwen is our group leader. We're now at the moment around 18 people. And um, the background of most people is a bit mixed. So some have more background in mathematics, computer science, medical physicists, and uh, now just last week, two, two engineers started. And um, in a nutshell, we look at sort of advanced computational techniques for 3D imaging. and um, Normally, you always, when you think about imaging, you typically think about uh, applications in healthcare. Um, but there is also imaging used in a lot of other fields. Um, and most of our collaborations are actually from rather science, uh, scientific imaging or industrial imaging. And um, something that the, the work group is, is quite well known for is the Astra Toolbox, which is a, is a toolbox for X-ray tomographic imaging that I'll talk a bit about later. And um, around now almost five years ago, uh, we opened a lab, so-called Flexray Lab. So we have an own X-ray CT scanner that's custom made for us. Um, and this is linked to a large scale computing hardware. And I'll also talk a bit more about this later. Um, but before we go into these details, let me zoom out a bit and um, talk a bit about um, sort of the background of what is imaging, in particular computational or mathematical imaging. So imaging has quite broad applications and historically probably the earliest um, instances of imaging began when people, um, you know, people always looked uh, at the stars at night and wondered what's going on there. But at some point they started doing that a bit more systematically and with the, the help of tools. So with the help of lenses, they build telescopes. And uh, here is now an example of sort of the, the state of the art or the, the latest uh, uh, results in, in that area. This is the, the famous picture of the black hole. 
um, taken by a big array of, of different telescopes around the world. And um, then the, the data from these telescopes had to be uh, carried on, on stacks of hard disks and, and uh, scientists actually had to fly around the world to carry that data. And um, then pipe it through some big computational imaging pipeline to get this image out at the end. So um, it's actually quite an interesting um, sort of topic, how to compute such an image. And then um, once people had lenses to look into far away or distant images or, or objects, um, they also realized that they, you can also use those to look at what's very close and very small. So microscopy is um, probably then the other very well-known application of imaging in life and material science. And um, already talked about medical imaging. So depending on what contrast is interesting, you have different imaging modalities that all work with different sort of physical principles and will later give you different information. So <clears throat> you already talked about X-ray CT. Most people also know magnetic resonance imaging, ultrasound imaging. This here is a positron emission tomography scan of a human body. And you see where radioactive tracer accumulates. Um, then another uh, area that's that's quite some, some, some interest and, and scale is to your physical imaging. So traditionally, people wanted to know what's in the ground below them. Um, ideally, they wanted to know whether there's anything uh, uh, useful or uh, valuable in the ground below them. So that's um, example seismic imaging. Um, and the somewhat related field is remote sensing. So there I have, um, for example, satellites far away from the Earth. And I want to know what's going on on the ground. So uh, traditionally, this, this evolved uh, for military and intelligence purposes. But nowadays, whole sort of earth and climate science relies on measurement of measurements of what's precisely going on on the atmosphere or on the ground. Um, this here, for example, is an image of the surface temperature of the Atlantic. And um, what's sort of um, getting more and more um, sort of common nowadays is also industrial process imaging. So uh, you have expensive sort of parts that are manufactured and you want to know in a non-destructive way whether they're manufactured in the right way. Or for example, in um, we have projects together with the food industry on food quality control. So the question is, can you during food processing uh, figure out if there's something wrong, if there's maybe foreign objects in meat or something like this. Nowadays, more and more imaging is used in those facilities. But um, sort of for us, um, as, as mathematicians, to abstract this a bit, um, so in some sense, mathematical imaging, you always want to reconstruct some spatially distributed quantities of interest. And you typically only have indirect observations. And now you want to link those um, through algorithms derived from rigorous mathematics. And this makes imaging a classical inverse problem. And um, just to introduce that a bit, think about that you have unknowns u, which in our case are the image. And you have some data, some indirect observational data f. And they're linked in the simplest case to such an equation where the unknowns are uh, mapped to sort of data. And then you add a bit of noise to it. And this mapping to data is a so-called forward operator. Uh, this models all the physics of your imaging modality. And um, normally, that takes the form of the solution operator of a partial differential equation. And, and the, the typical problem here is that Ill, uh, inverse problems are ill posed. So think about it like this. Um, you need to get new glasses. And your optician would like you to see this. This is the original image U. Um, but instead, all you see is this. So um, computing this, this image here on the right from the image on the left is pretty easy. You just take it and you blur it with the Gaussian kernel. But retrieving the information from this blurred image, you see, is, can be quite difficult. And what you can see is the smaller you get. So if you get to smaller scales, more information is lost. And so it's more difficult to recover. And that's a typical. Um, a feature of inverse problems that um, these forward operators compress information on smaller scales uh, more extensively than on larger scales. So what are we going to do about it? Um, if we want to solve these problems, so imagine that you get this data and you should recover this, 
the only way to do it is to introduce some sort of a priori information on the unknowns u. And just as another example, imagine um, <clears throat> a situation that you have a three-dimensional object and all you observe is a shadow on the wall from a light source. So you know that in principle, um, this is you cannot uniquely recover the three-dimensional object from a two-dimensional projection unless you know something more about the object. So if you just show me this shadow, then this is very difficult. If you also tell me that this comes from two human hands, then I might, while I still might not be able to uniquely identify it, I can probably come up with a, an approximate solution that's very close. And um, that's typically the trick in inverse problems. First, to identify that, that unique information, this a priori information on the object, and then formulate it in a mathematical way that's somewhat usable. So here I would need to make some sort of mathematical model of human hands and then some parameterized model, and then see if it can fit those parameters to this data. And there you already see that this might um, be quite a tricky task um, to, to formulate such a model. And just um, as an overview, of the so the normal sort of workflow that you go through in inverse problems um, typically involves different stages. You start with mathematical modeling. Um, so there you look at the physics of the imaging device, for example, an X-ray CT. You need to know how do X-ray photons interact with uh, matter, so biological tissues, for example. This typically leads to some partial differential equations. So here I wrote down the radiative transfer equation that governs how photons travel, um, subject to absorption and scattering. And then you do some approximations, and at the end you arrive at some model that you can work with. Then you need to figure out how do I want to do the reconstruction. Um, and there's different sort of approaches, classical, somewhat uh, approaches that regularize uh, the inverse uh, solution in a certain way. Um, there's a whole school that tries to um, cast it as a problem of statistical inference. You basically say, OK, it's a statistical estimation problem. I got noise on it. I got some incomplete information. Um, what can I know about my unknowns? And nowadays, of course, um, there's big um, sort of area of uh, field of people looking at how can we solve these with machine learning problems? So how can we learn to solve inverse problems? Um, then you can look at um, sort of the theoretical analysis of either the problem or your reconstruction approach. You can ask yourself, well, when is this actually the solution unique? Um, can I give some conditions under which I can recover certain unknowns? And is this stable with respect to noise? And um, then you also need to, at some point, do computations. Um, so then we get go into the, sort of the computational algorithmical part. Um, so whenever the problem involves PDEs, you might often need to solve them. So you need to know how to numerically solve PDEs. Often involves linear algebra, um, optimization routines. And in particular, when you're in this sort of statistical or Bayesian setting, you might want to quantify uncertainty, and then you need to sample um, distrib very high dimensional distributions using Mon Markov chain Monte Carlo methods. So this typically involves some sort of large scale computing, um, where you can do parallel computing, GPU computing, and so on. Now, um, what are the sort of the current challenge or the major challenges of computational imaging? Um, <clears throat> so once in a while, there's new modalities, um, and then you need to develop all the whole machinery for these things. And uh, for example, Giovanni is also looking into photoacoustic imaging. Um, so this is a sort of new, rather new imaging modality. Um, then there's always a, um, sort of modalities that are already established. You have that typically the data that you get from these devices just grows faster than you can uh, come up with or that, that you can um, deal with it. So nowadays, a lot of things are multispectral. Um, you often have now machines that measure different imaging modalities at the same time. And um, the detectors and everything um, give you more and more higher and higher resolution. So just as one example, down here, you can see a synchrotron. Uh, there you can get extremely uh, uh, pure high energy X radiation. Um, with that, you can reach very high resolutions. And um, so, last time we visited that synchrotron um, and talked to the people there, with sort of um, 
challenges they have for the image reconstruction. Um, one of the scientists told us that he wants to reconstruct an, an image of size 4K by 4K by 16K. Um, and so if you, if you just want to store that in single precision, that's already one terabyte just to store the image. And you can imagine that the, the data that they have is several, and, um, is, is still then multiples of that. So, um, but in principle, their detectors and everything uh, can give you that much data. Um, the question is just, can you actually reconstruct that? Um, so that's one trend. Then there's a trend that you want to have the same information, but ideally you want to measure less. So in X-ray CT, for example, the exposure to radiation is harmful. So we'd like to minimize that for your patient. So the question is often, can I get images with the same diagnostic quality from less photons? Or maybe or not from all around? For practical reason, you can only view an object from several sides. Um, <clears throat> or you might... Um, somehow deal with measurements that are compressed in a certain way. Um, so here's an example from dynamic MRI. This is cardiac imaging, um, where in order to increase the temporal resolution, so we're doing dynamic imaging, um, we measure compressed our data in some sort of compressed format. And then the question is how to reconstruct that well. Um, then there's a lot of um, things going on about um, sort of uh, disrupting normal imaging routines in the way that um, you want to image things in real time. So normally at a synchrotron, you do your experiment, you get your terabytes of data, you go home, and then it takes months uh, to reconstruct all of that. And then when you realize something went wrong, you have to go back and do it all over again. The question is, can you also do that or close that loop and basically do reconstructions in real time while you do the experiment? Because if you can do that, you can think about uh, stuff like adapting the scan to the object while you're doing it. So online, a sort of online adaptation. Uh, so think about that you have a specific question, maybe a diagnostic hypothesis. This patient has disease X. And now you give the scanner a budget of radiation and tell it to, in the best possible way, gather evidence for or against this hypothesis. Um, which typically means that you don't just scan um, in a normal, uninformed way, but that you somewhat adapt um, what, you, what you're going to do there. Okay, and then <clears throat> there's other things. Um, quantitative imaging is basically the whole idea that um, in, the, in the good old times, so to say, uh, all, you, all we had to do is just produce an image that trained radiologists would look at. And they would just study all the imaging artifacts and everything. And they, they would know um, from that image whether, the, say, the patient has cancer or not. Um, ideally, we would like to get sort of this trained radiologist out of the loop and uh, use imaging more in the way to test hypothesis. Um, and then the whole sort of imaging chain needs to become much more uh, robust. And in principle, you also at every stage need to quantify what uncertainties are in the images that you actually get. Uh, so that's another big area. And <clears throat> now the area that we're going to talk about today exclusively is how to get machine learning into all of these things. So the initially, you want to think about um, if I have now tools like deep learning, how do I bring them into image reconstruction routines? Um, first thing you typically face is that the, the data volumes that you look at are much bigger than, say, in, in normal images. I mean, typically, you either already have pretty high resolution 3D volumes or in dynamic imaging, you have 4D volumes. And um, you will also, like in any application, immediately run into the problem of training data. And um, so that's what we're going to look into in a bit more detail. And to understand that, um, I quickly um, also need to talk a bit about the the sort of the history of image reconstruction. If you look at a, an application like X-ray CT, then um, what people started with as the earliest X-ray CT scanners, the reconstruction methods were what I call analytical. So the idea is you really look at the mathematical problem uh, formulated in infinite dimensional spaces, so a function uh, operator mapping a function to a function. And uh, then you think about what is the inverse to that operator. And um, so this is uh, computationally extremely cheap, but typically has a big reconstruction error. It's not very robust against noise or undersampling and so on. 
So um, this is a bit sort of what people did in the 80s. Then in the 90s, um, people went over to what's called model-based or iterative reconstructions, where you simply make a model of um, how your data is generated. And then um, you fit this model, um, or you, then you fit an image through this model to the data in a non-linear least squares way. And um, so that already gives you a better reconstruction error, but the reconstruction time increases considerably. And then around 2005, 2006, people came up with this idea of sparsity. So before that, the image reconstruction routines were somewhat um, yeah, ignorant towards the image content. Um, so they, they would work well for any sort of image. And after that one, realize that if I have more information about the images, for example, that they have low um, uh, complexity in a specific domain, say they have sparse gradients or something, um, if I can use that in the image reconstruction, then I can get much better results, which much less data. However, the reconstruction time again increases. And now we're somewhat in that phase on that wave where we do machine learning everywhere. And um, there's really not a good way to just connect or continue these lines here because machine learning basically starts at the disadvantages of, say, either analytical or model-based or sparsity-based methods and tries to somewhat um, replace the components or tries to keep the good features of these methods but just sort of repair their disadvantages using machine learning tools. So, for example, I want to have a method that's as fast as an analytical method, but has a much lower reconstruction error. Or something that has a reconstruction error like sparsity, but much shorter computational time. And this is uh, what we're in right now. <clears throat> and there's different sort of ways of doing that. Um, so by the way, that's a very nice um, sort of overview paper. And um, so the main approaches of how to use deep learning and image reconstruction. So here, these are somewhat symbolize my, my CNN networks. Um, the earliest or simplest one is that, that I take my data and I just pipe it through a very fast analytic reconstruction method that will give me an image with a lot of artifacts and noise. But then I train a network to just remove that art, these artifacts and noise. And so I just use image to image networks. Um, then the second idea is um, if I do that, um, I might lose all the consistency to my data in here. So I don't really know what that network is doing here. So maybe I can also go another, through another pass um, and turn this into an iterative scheme where the output is projected forward compared to the data. And then I go through the analytical reconstruction again. So this way um, I increase sort of the data consistency and I typically need much short, smaller networks here. There's approaches where you think, you say, okay, maybe I learn the complete mapping from data to image, um, but for most practical applications, that's impossible at the moment. And there are also approaches where I say, well, if the problem is that the data, for example, is too noisy or unassembled, then maybe I just train a network to uh, generate sort of perfect data. And for perfect data, an analytic reconstruction then gives me a good um, uh, result. Okay, so, um, so these are the main sort of approaches. Now, what are the main challenges? Um, so just in simple terms, so the main, um, if you go to any sort of proper application, then the first question is always, do we actually have any training data to train my networks? Um, for sort of real applications, specifically in medical imaging, um, the, the um, sort of evaluation of how robust are these methods and do they really uh, do what I want is, is quite essential. Um, so let's say in the, the more, let's say, non-learned traditional methods, I would typically just compute a few results for, for some simulated data and maybe a few examples, and then people would get a feeling for how this method works. For uh, machine learning, this doesn't go uh, so well. I really need to evaluate them quite um, thoroughly to, to understand what they do and also uh, make sure that they never do anything uh, that they shouldn't do. <clears throat> so we're first quickly going to look into that. Um, so because if you, if you are sort of on the end that you just uh, develop algorithms uh, for deep learning in, in image reconstruction, 
you can typically just start with a lot of large um, uh, sort of open benchmark data sets. For example, uh, MNIST is a, is a simple data set. And uh, you can just simulate artificial uh, imaging data by just simulating how X-ray works. Um, if you really want to do sort of um, do it with real data, there's actually very few suitable data sets. So there's one exception, for example, a fast MRI data set. It's a data set of MRIs uh, from knee, from the knee. Um, it's released by, by Facebook together with uh, NYU. Um, for X-ray CT, um, the situation is, is, is much worse. There's hardly any suitable data sets that really give you projection data. This has something to do with how most X-ray scanners also work. Um, so most of the X-ray CT data sets are, um, just give you the reconstructed images, not the raw projection data, not the photon count data. And especially clinical data is extremely hard to get. So um, I'm going to um, show you a bit how, so we had a project on uh, cone beam computed tomography. Um, so just to understand that, um, this, the medical scanner that I showed on my first slide, um, their source and detector are rotating around the patient while the patient is, is driven through the scanner on a bat. And that means that in principle, the source and detector do a sort of helix around the uh, patient. Now, this is a nice geometry because it gives you very complete data. But uh, in geometry that's much more common is what's called circular cone beam. So there, imagine that you have the source and the detector fixed, and you have the object on a rotation table in the middle. And now this, this object is just rotated in the beam. Um, and this is very standard for lab CTs, also the CT that we have here. And there's also some systems like that in medical imaging, for example, in dental imaging. When you go to the dentist and get a, an X-ray CT there, then it's typically a cone beam CT scan. The problem is the data it collects is, in, is, is not complete. Um, <clears throat> so, so this is, uh, was a project um, together with the um, cone beam CT manufacturer, Plamica, and our, um, our university clinic here. Um, this cone beam CT is, is getting more and more important in clinical applications. It also has much lower radiation dosages and so on. So people would like to use it more often. And in many, um, for many applications where you use it, what you want to do at the end is segmentation. For example, you do a scan of the, the skull with such a cone beam CT, and then you want to segment all the bones. And for that nowadays, you would like to use deep learning because uh, that's fast and, and gives pretty good results. The problem is that these cone beam CT reconstructions have a lot of artifacts, and compared to a conventional CT, the image quality is in principle much worse. So um, the question was, how can we, you know, can can deep learning help with that and give us segmentations that are as good as from a medical scan? And just uh, as an example down here, so that's a cone beam CT scan of um, the dental. Uh, sort of facial area where you see here these these sort of uh, streaks here these are metal artifacts um, so of course if you have that you have a hard time segmenting um, the teeth properly um, this here shows um, basically the colors um, uh, uh, code the error that we make when segmenting surfaces of bones uh, for a reference model um, th so this is something that that people um, people that we worked uh, together with were very interested in. So these sort of systematic deviations from, from the surfaces. <clears throat> so what we did here, for example, is um, that we had anthropomorphic head phantoms. So these are um, sort of phantoms um, where real human bone was inserted and then coated with silicon. Um, and we scanned them in different scanners. So one here on the left, the image that you see is a normal clinical CBT, CBCT scanner. And on the right, we have a micro CT scanner. Um, so this is, is sort of a ground truth. You can see it has much better um, signal quality, so much less noise, um, as it has a higher resolution. Especially if you look at the bony structures here, you can see much more fine details here. So then here the idea was uh, we take these micro CT scans manually or semi-manually segment them and take them as a gold standard and then try to train the network to go from this reconstruction directly to the segmentation. Here's just a close-up of the, uh, the segmentation. And um, the first thing you run into is that 
you would like to pump your full 3D volume through a, a deep neural network, which typically doesn't work. So you have to reduce the image um, or the, the volume in, into lower dimensional patches or slices somehow. And it's not really clear how to best do that. So um, I had a PhD student here uh, together um, with the, the uh, university clinic, Jordi uh, Minima. And for his PhD, he first looked at, yeah, what are actually good uh, dimension reduction strategies to do that? And what are their, um, imp or what's the impact of that on the error that you make in particular uh, anatomical structures? And <clears throat> this is just uh, one of the results sort of, um, it shows then the the, um, the difference between the surface extracted with a particular type of neural network from the CBT CT scan versus the ground truth. Okay, um, so the next thing in that direction is, um, and as I told you, we also have a CBCT scanner. So um, our laboratory X-ray scanner has um, um, this is basically what's um, sort of sitting in the lab next to me. Um, so it, it looks like this. We have a source here, which uh, we can drive on different uh, down different axes. We have a detector on the other side. Um, and then we have a sample stage in the middle. There's motors in all of those. So I can, um, with that, I can somewhat remodel a lot of trajectories that we find in typical medical or industrial applications. Um, so, and we can fully, it's fully automated, so we can script it uh, to rebuild or mimic any sort of real life scenario. And the idea is that it allows people like us, so sort of mathematicians and computer scientists to do proof of concept experiments. So normally um, a group like us, a computational imaging group always needs collaborators with a machine to get real data. Um, and this is often not, not so easy because the real machines are, um, come from some, some companies and then they're not very keen on, on giving out the, the true underlying raw data, um, which makes it very difficult to, to really develop algorithms with real experimental data. Um, here, that, <clears throat> that is, is, is quite possible even for someone like me and I don't really have a technical background. Um, and so with that lab, uh, we can do a lot of um, sort of real data experiments, in particular for machine learning. So one of the first things we did is, is say, can we collect something like a bigger data collection um, and publish that as a uh, so for other groups to to use that as well. And um, of course, the, the the good thing about it is we can use uh, objects that you can radiate as much as you like. Um, so here we use, for example, walnuts. Um, so you can see here walnut in the holder. This is the source and the detector. This is then a typical projectional image uh, where you see the brighter it is, the more that radiation gets absorbed along that ray. And this here is then a reconstruction or slice through the reconstruction. So why did we take walnuts? Um, so we want to have something that has, uh, you know, for machine learning purposes, should have some natural interpopulation variability. Um, which you don't find in any sort of industrially uh, manufactured objects. It has different components. So it has this hard shell, a uh, softer inside. It has air-filled cavities and um, small to find or large to find scale features. And that makes it a reasonable good proxy for, for the, the sort of image uh, complexity that you have in an X-ray CT scan of a human head. Um, so for that one, we scanned uh, 42 3D samples and that gives you a lot of 2D data. And uh, in particular, to, to get a good ground truth for that, um, we scanned each walnut, so if this here is the walnut, on three different orbits. So the source and detector will move to different positions. And the idea behind that is if you, <clears throat> if you have that walnut and you put the source on the top end, and then you reconstruct it, you will get a very nice reconstruction of the upper part. But down here, you see that you get some sort of artifacts where you lose uh, that lower part of the walnut. This is called a high cone angle artifact. This is very common in cone beam CT uh, imaging. Depending on where you put the source, so if you put it in the middle, you got these artifacts on top of bottom and bottom. Um, but now if you combine all of this data and run it through an iterative reconstruction algorithm, you can get a perfect sort of uh, image of the walnut as a ground truth. So in some sense, you can use that data set um, with the idea of how can I get rid of these artifacts 
and you supervise learning because you have this this ground truth. And you can find these these data sets on Zenodo, uh, we have a community. Um, and if you want to play around with it, uh, there's MATLAB and Python scripts um, for that. And um, it's all described in this, this publication here in, in scientific data. Okay, and then um, Yodi also took that data set and also tried some, some strategies for cone angle artifact reduction. Mm. And um, so the idea here is, um, how can I somehow, given such input images, um, get this as a target? So basically remove these cone angle artifacts, because what you see here is that, in principle, this top layer here, which for the human skull would be just the top of the head, uh, you got these, these severe artifacts. And the idea, um, let's say, uh, that's, a, that's a problem that you can look at from different perspectives, and, and people have done very clever things uh, about it. We um, thought we start with uh, something very simple. And um, because if you, if you look at the geometry of this artifact, um, <clears throat> the, the normal way that you acquire the, this data is that the object is in the middle, and then you do a sort of angle by angle uh, projection um, acquisition. So for each angle, you get such an image. So later, your data consists um, basically of a 3D volume where you have the two spatial dimensions of the detector, and then uh, as the other dimension, you have the angle. And then in the image reconstruction, you again follow this sort of uh, angle by angle projection. Um, so basically, you take that data, you run some filter over it, and it looks like this, and then you back project it into this volume. Um, but from this whole setup, you also know that if I would somewhat uh, rotate this object, um, and then I would also could just rotate my data, and I would at the end arrive at the same sort of artifact, also just rotate it. So what it means is this, this, um, this cone angle artifact that I get from this whole pipeline here necessarily uh, shares an equivariance with respect to rotations. Uh, so if I rotate the object, I rotate the, the artifact as well. And um, from that perspective, um, <clears throat> the question is now, how do I best get rid of it? And um, so what you could first do, or the traditional workflow, say if I would train a CNN on that, is that I take the data, I do a reconstruction into a Cartesian volume, X, Y, Z, and then I would um, extract, so I cannot give this whole volume into a CNN, so instead I extract slices, and then I train a 2D CNN um, to just D, um, sort of to, to correct uh, these slices um, one after another. And so the problem with that is if, if you go back, so this is, a, is, a, is sort of a horizontal cut, um, if I would now slice in, in, in depth direction, so in basically here in this direction, you see that the artifact is more or less pronounced depending on where um, in my input I am. So in this topper part here, there's a lot of artifact. In the lower part, there's hardly any. So it means that um, if I would prepare my training data like that, um, I would have a very large inhomogeneity there. And it's quite tricky for a network to learn. And the idea was now, um, because I know that, in principle, this artifact shares this rotational uh, geometry, I should just um, do the dimension reduction in exactly the same way. So I can compute this reconstruction here, not into Cartesian volume, but directly on radial slices. And on radial slices, this artifact looks very much, the, or it looks very similar on radial slices. Um, so the variability of the artifact over the slices is much, much lower, which means the, the input and output distributions that I want to train a network on have a much, much lower variability. So it's much easier to learn. So then I pipe these slices through the network, I get the, slide, the, the corrected slices, and then I just need to resample them. And <clears throat> just as some, some sort of results, um, so here in the top row, you see a zoom into um, the, the original input image, um, where you see you got these strong artifacts here. Um, this is, in principle, the target. So this is the uh, image reconstructed from all of the data where we do not have any artifacts anymore. So I want to get from this to this. And um, just here, you can see that this happens if, if I just train a normal UNet on uh, coronal slices. Um, 
which are these sort of Cartesian, it's one of the Cartesian directions, where you can see it can do something, but um, they, uh, if you would zoom in, you'd see that there's a lot of inconsistency going on here, or the, um, the intensities here are not, not very clear. And if you do radial sampling instead, then you get very nice clear intensities here. It's a bit easier to see that on the, on the segmentations that we did uh, down here. We can see these streaks here. Okay. Um, good. So that, that was a bit about um, sort of how can I, um, for the applications we have, um, reduce the dimensions. Um, and uh, apply it to concrete uh, problems. Um, next, we want to see um, what are what sort of interesting questions do I have when I go to algorithm design. So there's a different way, <coughs> or let's say a different um, idea of how I can use machine learning in the context of this high-dimensional, uh, high-resolution 3D imaging. Namely, um, we go back to the the filtered back projection. Um, the filter back projection is the, the classical analytical method that I talked about in the beginning, these four ways of imagery construction. In principle, it's just I take my data Y, then I convolve it with a filter, and the filter does something very similar to differentiating the data along one dimension. And then after that, I back project my filtered data just using the adjoint operator of my forward operator, and that's called filtered back projection. And um, we know that filtered back projection is, is easy to implement, it's fast, um, but the quality of the reconstruction is not so good when the noise level is high or if I have limited data. So now the idea is, um, if I look into that, so there is already a filter in here, right? And, and then there's just this step, this back projection, which gets me from data space into image space. So I could also uh, think about um, how if I just learn these filters or learn a filter, but instead of just learning one filter, I could just learn a couple of different filters. So for each filter, I would compute a different image through the filter back projection. And then I just uh, compute a nonlinear combination of those um, on each pixel individually. So that's something that um, Daniel Pelt, who worked in our group for quite a long time, um, came up with in his, his PhD uh, already sort of before the um, for deep learning became really popular in imagery construction. Um, it's in principle just a very shallow network. Um, so here you just learn the convolution filters and then the weights of how to best combine this, this nonlinear FPP in the end. And um, the advantage of that is that this is very um, lightweight in a sense that you're still computationally efficient because you only compute, say, four or five um, filtered back projections. There's very few trainable parameters because these filters are um, actually one dimensional. And um, you have a lot of training data because every image um, or sort of image data set gives you for every pixel a training sample, so to say. And here you see uh, a bit what, what that can do. So this is a filtered back projection um, computed when I have a lot of projections. And then uh, I lower the number of projections um, to 5% of the original number of angles. So then you see that a normal filtered back projection gives quite a bad image with a lot of noise. Um, but if instead you do this neural network FVP uh, with, I think here, four diamond different filters, and you learn optimal filters uh, beforehand, then you can get a very nice uh, reconstruction with very minimal effort. And this is something that can, in principle, also still work if you go to high resolution 3D volumes, where you cannot use any neural networks anymore. So at currently, um, neural networks, while you can do them in 3D, um, they're typically limited when it comes to the sizes of the volumes that you can put in. So anything, say, where you already go to 1K by 1K by 1K is typically completely um, out of question at the moment with current hardware. Um, <clears throat> however, if you, if you use these sort of shallow um, um, uh, neural network uh, things, you can you can still do that. So that's then an um, extension of that to 3D that um, a PhD student in our group, uh, Rin Lacherwerf, uh, developed. Um, so he took this idea and um, basically then implemented that. So just to walk you through, this is a normal FDK reconstruction in 3D. See a single slice. 
you see is a bit blurry. Um, here, this is an iterative reconstruction of the same data, which you see looks better, but from the computational times, this takes um, yeah, around 100 times longer. So these are reconstruction times. So this uh, would, is out of question for a lot of high resolution, uh, high throughput scenarios. Um, this is this, this neural network FDK, um, which computes four um, FDK reconstructions. So it's somewhat, it's maybe around three or four times uh, uh, slower than the original FDK, but it gives you a reconstruction which is almost the same or even a bit better quality than the iterative scheme. So the idea here is really that you can get similar quality but much, much faster. Um, as a comparison here, this is what you get when you apply, um, for example, a unit slice by slice on the resulting volume. So you see this gives you much, much better quality. But the problem here is also that these take much longer um, to train. They take days or weeks to train. And then also in the execution, piping um, a thousand slices of 1K by 1K through a network also takes quite some time. All right. So I think in the interest of time, I go on a bit. Um, one thing, um, or one, one work that I wanted to, to show here, um, if you're interested in the different sort of approaches of how to, um, how to integrate neural networks into, um, into image reconstruction, um, there's a nice paper by um, a group from Bremen and uh, together with uh, some people of our work group. Um, they looked at how can we actually compare all these different methods because by now there's there's tons of different methods um, and it's often a bit difficult uh, that they um, often it's difficult to reproduce their results um, so they said okay how can we uh, can we get somehow a nice benchmark data set and um, they did this they scanned apples in our lab so that's somewhat an, an application from food control where this is a slice through an apple and you want to find these, these dark spots here, which point to problems. And uh, you would want to do it with as little um, projectional uh, angles as possible. Um, and um, so they, they came together in a big uh, uh, sort of code sprint and implemented diff various different um, deep learning assisted imagery construction techniques, for example, learn primal dual algorithm or others um, and then they compared them all on this data set and in, in the paper um, you can also find the links to that data set. Okay um, <clears throat> so but there are also often uh, situations where basically um, the supervised training what we did up to now that you you really go out there and try to get a big training data set for a particular application simply doesn't work so then the question is is there anything else you can do? And um, so this was uh, work, or the work I'm showing now is from Alad Hendrickson. Um, so he's just um, sort of finishing his PhD here in our group. And um, he looked at these, these particular scenarios. So for example, um, pretty often in synchrotrons, um, that also in micro CT facilities, um, in scientific imaging, you often have very unique objects. Um, so you cannot go out and get a big training data set collection of it. You just have, say, one object. Um, and the question is, can you, um, let's say, instead of scanning this one object with very high resolution over a large volume, can you somehow improve the resolution um, with the same scanner with just a limited increase of computational time and scan time? And the idea that he looked at is that a lot of objects in scientific imaging uh, have sort of self-similar structures. So um, the idea was, can we um, do the following? We have an object here, and we first do a, a big or sort of a rough scan on a low resolution of the complete object. And then we zoom into one particular region of image and scan it with high resolution. And Assuming that I find sort of the same structures um, that I find in the, in the region of interest, also in the rest of the sample, can I then combine this data in some nice way to sort of upsample or to get the same high resolution here, but just all over in the same volume. So, um, and, and that's a bit the, what they call on the fly resolution improvement uh, using machine learning. Um, so here the idea is first, yeah, as I said, we, we uh, acquire the full view, we acquire the region of interest, 
we reconstruct the full view in a coarse volume. And from these two data sets, I can then do a region of interest tomography to uh, just reconstruct a smaller volume in a higher resolution. Once I have that, I can train a neural network to um, sort of uh, increase the resolution um, of the, the low res reconstruction as an input to the resolution of the high res. Once I have that, I can apply that to basically the whole volume to upsample that. And um, that actually works for, for certain structures that, that works quite well. So here um, we scanned oatmeal as a, as a proxy to, to samples that you normally find in, in material science. And um, so here is basically the, uh, the low resolution, the normal low resolution reconstruction. As you zoom in, that's the high resolution reconstruction. So that's somehow the, the hidden ground truth. So here we don't have that ground truth. But um, here are the two ways of doing this um, as a sort of up on the fly image uh, improvement. Um, and this is a, com uh, is a comparison to doing just simple upsampling of the low resolution reconstruction. So you see it does um, do quite a good job in, in getting um, sort of better results for these structures. Felix, you have a few minutes. Yeah. Ah, okay, <clears throat> good. I'll speed up a bit. Um, so, so this was still uh, with a bit of a trick. Now the question is, can you also do it completely uh, unsupervised or uh, self-supervised? And um, there the idea is there is um, a lot of uh, sort of frameworks for self or unsupervised learning out there. So the idea is in supervised learning, you always got these pairs of say no a noisy image and the ground truth noise-free image. And then you train a CNN and then at runtime, you apply it to noisy images. Um, if you don't have that, for, um, there's other tricks. So imagine that instead of um, the ground truth, you have a different um, noisy image of the same uh, thing. Then you could, again, just try to train a CNN. And the idea is a bit, if the noise in these two images is statistically independent, there's nothing that the network can actually learn or nothing useful over a big data set that the network can learn. Um, to, to kind of transform one noise into another. So instead, what it actually learns is the, the noise-free ground truth. So you sort of force it to look for similar structures or coherent structures in these images because the noise is not coherent. It's called noise-to-noise. -noise. There's an extension of that. And Allard basically took that and expanded that to tomography, and it's called noise-to-inverse. There the idea is you um, acquire full sinogram and then you split it and then you train networks on um, sort of finding common structures in the reconstructions done from subsets of data. Um, and <clears throat> the interesting thing is that with that, you can get pretty close in performance to a fully supervised uh, network or network that's trained in a fully supervised way. Um, of course, you can never quite get there and it depends on the noise levels. Um, but uh, the, the main uh, or the kind of surprising thing is that it works quite well. OK, then uh, he applied this to fuel cells in a, um, in a synchrotron experiment. Um, so I'm not going to go into the details, but um, I can, I can uh, give you the references later. And um, I don't know, I <laughs> probably don't have many minutes left, but um, just, uh, I also promised to look into other uh, applications. Um, and so up to now, everything was X-ray CT. And uh, just at the very end, I want to also show you a bit about what we do in ultrasonic imaging. But I'm afraid I won't have time to, to um, explain this in, in too much details. So ultrasonic imaging compared to um, uh, the X-ray CT, what we have up till now is a nonlinear wave-based imaging modality. It has certain advantages, but typically, um, or the typical uh, handheld 2D reflection mode ultrasound that we're used to has pretty low image quality, and the interpretation of it is difficult. Um, so we had a postdoc uh, working on how to integrate deep learning into typical um, reflectivity-based ultrasound imaging uh, reconstruction pipelines. And um, just sort of in a nutshell, uh, what he did is is um, integrating the image formation technique into a network. Um, and then you just need to, when you want to train that network end to end to go directly from data to a segmentation, 
here this is an application non-destructive testing then you need to figure out um, basically what the edge joint of that operator is to be able to use back propagation to train it um, but this, this was quite easy and then you can get very nice results um, but in the interest of time I will skip that um, we also now recently applied that to ultra-fast ultrasound imaging um, where you use just single plane waves um, <clears throat> and the last thing that I want to um, point out is uh, that you, if you're interested in this X-ray CT things, um, we have this Astra toolbox, um, which is a high performance computing um, toolbox for X-ray CT. And um, you can inter or there is, is two ways to integrate that into deep learning frameworks. One is to use what's called ODL, Operator Discretization Library, that has a plug or that uses Astra as a backend for any sort of X-ray CT stuff. Um, but Alad also recently um, released an own sort of lightweight package called Tomosipo, with which you can directly couple it uh, to, for example, a PyTorch or TensorFlow. Okay, with that, uh, let me come to a summary. Um, so I wanted to, um, beginning, spend quite some time emphasizing that computational imaging um, would always keep us busy in the way that the amount of data and the, the challenges are always ever increasing. And um, so from that perspective, we're very happy that deep learning seems to be um, a very good tool to solve a couple of problems that we have. And so we can keep up with um, sort of the demands from the application side. However, um, compared to, let's say, more traditional um, applications and image processing or computer vision, uh, I often find that the, the applying or getting deep learning to work on our problems is not trivial and um, it's often much more work than you think, uh, especially getting training data for real applications, in particular clinical applications where you cannot easily get ground truth. A good ground truth is very hard. Um, so that's why more and more people look at uh, self and unsupervised training and uh, showed you a bit about that. Um, and <clears throat> I, am, I didn't talk much about it, but um, in principle, um, it's very interesting to sort of combine all the old techniques that we have with data or image domains, CNNs, um, in one way or another. Um, it, but one has to be aware that mm, yeah, many of the, the methods that are proposed at the moment and are only tested on, say, simulated 2D data, never scale up to 3D applications. So we really also have to think about sort of different and novel methods. And just at the very end, I talked um, uh, yeah, briefly in a nutshell, told you that um, um, it's, it's actually very interesting to extend these things to um, more difficult imaging problems, say nonlinear wave-based stuff. Okay, and with that, I want to thank you for your attention. Um, sorry for running out of time, but uh, if you have any questions, let me know. Thank you very much. All right, are there questions or comments? Um, I have a couple of questions. Thanks uh, for a very nice talk. Um, so, uh, I mean, actually, the main curiosity that, uh, um, I mean, I, okay, maybe it's, uh, uh, because I was curious to see maybe some uh, more details on the architectures of some networks you used. Um, yeah. I know if you could uh, maybe take one example, and, and because you were showing some yeah. comparison, for example, with yeah. know, UNet, but so I was wondering if you were using also some kind of uh, autoencoder uh, kind of uh, net network or different ideas. I don't know. Yeah. Uh, um, so, so there's, there's one, um, sort of interesting thing here, the, um, so Daniel Pelt, um, also then uh, later looked into, to this issue because, um, so another thing that, that you will find, um, is that the standard sort of UNet type, uh, networks, um, which basically are just an encoder decoder network with some up and down sampling in between. Um, they are great. Um, but they, they also have certain drawbacks and especially when computation is a problem. So say when you have big volumes, um, they typically hold way too many copies of images. Um, and so, so they, 
yeah, so they're not the most efficient uh, things, to be honest. And um, so he looked into uh, something which is called mixed scale dense networks. So there the idea is that um, you keep the same image size, you just dilate the convolutions. Um, so that's a different way of aggregating um, sort of cost to fine scale uh, information. And um, you reuse all the computations that you do. So you never copy anything, but um, basically every layer is just a single image. And um, then uh, dense, also in, in general, dense networks just connect every image that you computed up to that to the next layer. Um, so, so it's a bit, um, <clears throat> yeah, saying that the network should always use all the information it has computed up till now. And um, it can then still figure out um, whether it should suppress any of that. But you don't impose a certain structure of how the network uses um, computations that it has done up to then. And um, so he looked into that. Um, so these are these dilated uh, things. And um, he basically found that most often, and, and we also found that in our applications, these network um, give you the same performance as units with a magnitude of parameters less, um, which means there's much less trainable parameters, uh, which makes it easier, faster to train, and often more robust, so they generalize better. So units can do quite a good job, but um, you often just have to have a lot of training data. And in yeah, a lot of the applications we have, you don't have that. So yeah, network architectures are one critical thing to look at as well. Yeah. No, thanks. I didn't know this uh, architecture, but mm -hmm. so it's not really um, in the class of enco uh, encoder decoder networks. Completely different. Um, no, no. Um, so that that whole. No, in that sense, there is no sort of inter intermediate uh, code at which it arrives uh, that you then could do for compression or whatever, or where you mm -hmm. have, um, say, where you have, let's say, a precise definition of, OK, it encoded these things here in this code, and this code has this and that dimension. So it, it which gives you a sort of idea of the, the inherent image complexity, right? Um, and so here you do in, in that in that network um, you don't have that. The idea is really to just have an image to image network um, without imposing any sort of additional structure. So it doesn't need to go through a bottleneck or anything. Um, I mean for for other applications, so for example, for that ultrasound imaging, we did look at um, encoder decoder architectures because, one side project there was uh, to figure out how to best compress ultrasound data. Um, the idea would sort of long term be that you already compress the data on the device and then only send compressed data um, to the reconstruction machine, which is typically um, not on the device itself. So then, yeah, these, these architectures are better. Another quick question. Um, so you. You were showing this um, data set of uh, walnuts, and yep. uh, which actually reminded me a lot of another data set of no walnuts by Samuel in Helsinki. <laughs> yeah, I mean that's that's how we got the idea. Um, okay. So so but, yeah yeah we got uh, uh, sort of started uh, with that and uh, then thought okay let's yeah. No, but apart from that, so um, did you? I don't know. Um, okay, this is just a rough question, but did you try to? Uh, I mean, you, you were using for some, I, I didn't remember exactly which application, but you were using as a proxy of human head. Mm -hmm. And uh, yeah. so did you try to do the training on these walnuts and then apply the findings on uh, like yeah. real uh, heads? Uh, yeah, so we, we also did that uh, at some point. Um, and this doesn't work out of the box. And um, so, I mean, there's, there's several things in there. Uh, so depending on the network architecture, um, <clears throat> one important thing is that you get sort of intensity scalings and so on, right? So, I mean, in most of these network architectures, um, if you have these typical uh, things that are somewhat convolutional layers, bias, and then nonlinearity, um, they, they sort of in, have intrinsic thresholding mechanisms in there that depend on the intensity or T of inactivation. So if you, let's say they are not um, 
uh, scaling invariant in the sense that if you just take the same image and multiply it with a factor and give it in, that um, they give you out the same sort of uh, activation, just just also multiplied, it typically won't work. Um, so that's one thing um, you need to then sort of see how do you scale things because in the convolutional kernels, depending on what what um, input resolution you have, you you sort of encode which features you expect on which spatial scale. And that might also not be the same. So there you would first need to sort of interpolate the nut into a human head uh, sort of. Oh, sure, sure. sure. Um, <clears throat> so, and, and we did that. And I mean, we did some of that. Um, and it turns out it's, it's not, um, it's, it's not, it doesn't work out of the box. So then um, we thought, okay, then you would need to do some sort of transfer learning, or let's say the, the question would be, but is it still useful um, as a start to then train on real human heads? And this is in principle also what we still want to find out, um, except that uh, during this project, um, the, we were supposed to, to acquire a big clinical data set, um, but then COVID came in between and um, delayed everything. So ideally, we would have gotten from this to a real clinical data set uh, where we would have matched uh, images of cone beam CT and medical CT for patients. So sometimes you have that because you just happen to have a patient that you need to put in the medical scanner and then as well later in a cone beam CT scanner. So then you could somehow assemble a supervised data set from that. Um, yeah, but unfortunately, this, this didn't work out so far. Okay, I understand. Thanks. Any any other comments or questions? I was I was curious about the the filters that you learn in the in the CT example. I mean, do yeah. they look like do they look like the true one or I mean? Um, oh yeah, that, that's a that's an interesting question. Um, so I can I would need to ask Dan for that, um, and I remember also discussing that with Dan at some point. Um, I forgot what it, what the answer to that was, um, but it, it is something. Um, so it, it does for sure um, here depend sort of on how you set up the the uh, the simulation. So here this is um, this is actually real data that's not simulated, um, but of course you could first just um, try and simulate that or use mm -hmm. it on simulated data. And then it would actually really be the question, um, uh, I mean, then in principle for some scenarios, you can write down analytically what the optimal filter is. And the question is if, if you can also recover that. And I remember that, I mean, most time he said, yeah, it, it's, it's somewhat similar, but then um, you also see the modifications that come from sort of the discretization and also the noise levels. So, I mean, in, in sort of in, in normal um, X-ray CT, designing these filters here is also a bit of an art. I mean, you know that there is an analytical filter, that's the exact one, you know, in the, in the theoretical sense, but in reality, uh, other filters are used. In reality, you have to have a cutoff and you, you dampen high frequencies a bit. And so there's all sorts of things. So there's a zoo of different filters that are somewhat engineered uh, for specific applications. And um, so Dan said that you can also see these sort of, or you see some of these modifications also turn up if you just train the filter. I see, I understand. All right. Any other comments or questions? If, if not, we can thank Felix again for the talk. And uh, well, hopefully we'll be able to see him in person at some point. Yeah, definitely. Yeah. <laughs>